claim in our eyes we're just seeing it as a slightly different from what they are. When we talk, we see things that are. Welcome to Strange Familiars. Hello, Allison. Hello, Timothy. You're back. Did I ever really leave? <laughs> back from the valley. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and 1982. No one knows what we're talking about, so we should just not do that. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Strange Familiars, everybody. If you have a sighting of something strange or a story you think we should cover or an encounter with something weird... Give us an email, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. We're always looking for stories. Now, is there an, a line that you draw? Like, you see, like, Glenn Danzig in your toast? Is that, like, a line, or do you want to hear about that? Um, Does it have to be a particularly on-point rendering, or...? I think I would want to hear about Glenn Danzig <laughs> in your toast. I don't know if it's podcast worthy. Yeah, but, yeah. But go ahead, it's... you know, go ahead and send all, all your weird stories. <laughs> I want to hear about all this stuff, and we'll see. Not all of it can come on the podcast, but you know. yeah, don't hold back. Speaking of podcast relative things, yes, a little bit of Iditarod coverage here. As we we do like to do a sports feature every now and again, <laughs> Jennifer. M shared a story. I never know if anybody wants me to use their last name. Yeah, that seems fair. Yeah, that's why I just use last initials unless I'm told otherwise. Jennifer shared a story in the Strange Miller's Gathering group about a guy on the trail, and I did a rod, and he keeps seeing a woman walk out at night. He's seen her several times. He's calling it a hallucination. Mm -hmm. The woman's wearing a robe. Mm -hmm. Red and black checked. She's wearing a robe. A robe. That's red and black checked. Red and black checked. And what does she look like otherwise? He doesn't say. It's not a really detailed article, but I'm going to see if I can track the guy down and uh, get him on the show. I think it'd be fantastic. What show did we used to watch where there was a member of the Iditarod over and over again? It was one of those... Just... Alaska Survival Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, the, that guy's one... One there is wanted a bunch of times. This was not him. Yeah. This was. This is fascinating. So uh, he's likening it to like a sleep deprivation thing. Yeah, he said he, he was like real tired. Uh-huh. He thinks it's like a hallucination thing, and he said he was you know almost falling asleep on the sled, I guess. And then this woman walks out of the trees, out of you know they're out of nowhere, basically. Yeah, they're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, right? in a red and black checked bathrobe. So, and what does he do at that point? Realize he's sleeping and wake up, or I don't know. he doesn't wait. The article yeah. is very sparse, but he then he said he saw her, uh, keep seeing her again after that. Oh wow! Yeah, I think we need to we need more details of that. Yeah, I got to track him down. That came on the heels of two other flannel woman stories we got. One of the stories I knew we had because another guest had mentioned they also had a flannel person account it was mm-hmm. a woman yeah and then we got another account from australia of all places of someone seeing the final woman the same day didn't they come in the mail the same day uh, they came within yeah like a very short period yeah, of time yeah very very short period of time of each other and we'll be talking about them on an upcoming flannel person show i mean mm-hmm. it's now and as soon as i said that you said like we're going to get flannel kids soon. Yeah, coming soon. <laughs> flannel there, children. We haven't exactly gotten flannel children yet. Well, mm. We've gotten flannel young people. 
Oh, okay. Since then. Flannel teenagers? Yes. Oh, they're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's... Uh, now, how do you feel about women entering into the flannel land? Me personally? Yeah, you personally. I'm glad for diversity myself. Yeah. I don't control flannel land, first of all. Flannel land? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm assuming that's where they all come from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Flannelandia. So the flannel man is just, it's this gift that keeps on giving. It's so amazing. I'm, and every time I think it sort of cools down a bit, mm-hmm. then it just starts getting, you know, like The thing I think is crazy crazier. is people will write, they will have just heard about it, or they'll be relating a story about that they heard from someone they knew previously. Like people that are unaware of sort of, I mean, how would they be of the phenomenon? Yeah, most people surrounds... who have contacted us have never heard it. Now, yeah. But now we're starting to get some where people are like, I listen oh, to Strange yeah. Familiars and I just saw a flower. <laughs> so crazy stuff. Uh, keep the flannel man flame burning, I guess. If, if you guys are spreading the word, it's working. I love it. That's so uh, flannel man. It's not going away anytime soon. I think it's going to be I mean, part as far of... as like mysterious characters to see. He's pretty benign compared to like I mean he he's I think in the same realm as your woman in white as far as being pretty uh mostly we've gotten some yeah. pretty dark ones lately too. Plus it's just disconcerting to ever see something that you're not intending to see but Yeah. So we're not talking about a flannel man tonight, are we? Or do you have confirmation that this person may or may not have been wearing flannel at the time? I mean, he may have worn flannel at some point. There's no way. <laughs> Who no. hasn't? Although we do know what he would wore, and it, I don't think he was changing clothes that often. Yeah, that's true. He didn't have like a... Uh, so tonight we're talking about William Woodruff, who I term William of the Fiery Flowers. Dave W. has been asking me to do this show. For a long time, because he bought the print early on. He's a, oh, yeah. a long time listener. I think Dave's been listening since episode one. Mm-hmm. Like, he's been right there. He's like, when are you going to do the, the show on, on William of the Fiery Flowers? And I'm like, ah, we'll see. I don't know. What I was doing is I was going to write a book on it. And I wanted to time. I thought I could knock it out real quick and then time the release of the show with the book and all this. And then the weird Bigfoot book with Josh happened. And this, this book is not coming anytime soon. Yeah. So it's time to do our show on William Woodruff. I keep looking up at the picture on the wall of him as if that's really him. <laughs> <laughs> this story starts with a photograph, as so many of our real-life stories that we mm-hmm. cover do. Real life. Now you got me falling into your... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> our story is based on people, historical people that we know existed, mm-hmm. as opposed to whatever the other things are mm-hmm. we don't quite know what bigfoot or flannel man are how about people thing. who made the census we'll just put it that way <laughs> there you go i don't think flannel man's on the census yet so william woodruff was on a postcard you bought me a postcard you just thought oh here, here's a neat guy you like wild men he looks kind of wild yeah and you bought me this postcard now i will print the postcard with the the show notes and i was like, oh he's neat and I put him on my, on my desk, and it got shuffled under papers. This is about, like, last spring or early summer you bought it for yeah. me. I don't even remember where you got it. Was that an eBay thing, or did you get it somewhere? Maybe a, maybe a postcard show postcard or something. Postcard show or something, yeah. I remember you just like, oh, here, I thought you'd like this guy. On it, it says William Woodruff, the Hermit of Colebrook, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Oh, it says Billy Woodruff. That's what it is. It said Billy Woodruff... Hermit of Colebrook, Connecticut. And it was neat, but it just got it got shuffled under papers and stuff at my desk, and it sat there for most of the summer. And one day, I don't remember what I was doing, but I was, you know, I was probably done editing the podcast and just like kind of shuffling through papers and stuff. And I was like, and it, you know, shuffled to the top. And I looked him up. I was like, oh, I'm going to see if there's any information on this guy out there, see who he was. So I type in what's on the postcard. It was Billy Woodruff, the Hermit of Colebrook River, Connecticut, is what's on it. And this amazing story comes up right away, which got me first obsessed with Billy. I prefer to call him William. Yeah, there's something to be said about the way that people refer to 
other people, if they use like a kind of a diminutive name, even into adulthood, I feel like that's very telling. Yeah. Like that you're thinking of someone as lesser or childlike or. Yeah. I'm not saying that you can't have like a nickname. Right. But there's a reason I don't call you Timmy. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really, I don't mind Tim, Timothy. Yeah. But, it, but, I, I but something I, that's um, overly juvenile or overly diminutive. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's sort of patronizing, and I feel that's probably, you know, what they thought of this man. Yeah, yeah. So I found a ton of articles on this guy. What we didn't find in articles, we filled in with genealogical research and so forth. He grew up in Colebrook River, Connecticut. I'm not sure how much of the old town is left anymore. I think it was one of those towns that were mostly taken down to... uh, build um, a reservoir that remember they were doing that um, in the um in the late 60s i think mm-hmm. and stuff but william was long dead by that time so the photograph you got me he was probably 80 80 years old in that photograph and while he looks he looks worn and bedraggled i mean mm-hmm. he definitely has a hermit look to him. yeah <laughs> He doesn't look 80 to me. He looks like he was holding it together pretty well, considering he probably lived a pretty hard life. Well, I think it has to... I mean, it keeps you young, all that it takes to survive those kind of conditions. So in the interim, we've read a lot about different hermits, and they have all different stripes from people who are sort of like recreational leisure hermits to uh, people who are full-time hermits to people who have mental health problems to people who in almost like uh, Nelson Raymire just too damn peculiar. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So that kicked off a whole hermit collecting thing for me and, and collecting these images of these hermit guys. And I think I have most of the American hermits along the way. I found a guy already written a book on these American hermits it's a little bit different than the book I intend to write. So I think there's room for two. Mm-hmm. I think there's room for two books. Uh, he doesn't have any of the images of these guys at all in them, though. So that's that's the advantage I have. I can reproduce the images of these guys. There's some kind of famous ones. Um, yeah, like who knew there were famous hermits? Yeah. You know, even I found two hermits around York. One was pretty famous. He built a park that people use for, like, up into the like fifties or something, he built a park in the eighteen hundreds, and huh. people—that's where he was living. But he kind of turned the whole area into this park, and people would come there and have their weddings or picnics and stuff. And went up into the you know the mid nineteen hundreds. That's crazy. And then uh, there's another hermit that we've been searching for. We found a really old article. He would have been alive in like the early eighteen hundreds, and we went looking for where he lived. He was in York as well. And we couldn't quite figure out. We have a good idea where he was, but we couldn't quite figure out exactly where he was. Yeah, once you get past like 1850s or so, the the census records get so wonky that it's difficult to figure out exactly where people lived and who was living with them. So, But William Woodruff was the start of all of it. And um, honestly, he might be the coolest story out of all of them. He's got a great story. Now, I'm sure the newspapers romanticized his story a little bit. There's a little bit And it's bit an of... odd thing to romanticize abject poverty, isn't it? Like, that's a, that's a peculiar notion. It is, but, I mean, I think in the same way that, you know, sideshows were fascinating to people uh-huh. in that age, I think these hermits were fascinating to people. Just and... people who totally live outside the norm. Yeah, exactly, which we've talked about before. Mm-hmm. These are the wild men, you know? Mm-hmm. I like William's story. I like how romanticized it is. And, you know, there were a lot of normal people who lived within the bounds of society, and we don't know their names. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. So, in a way, he was uh, standing out, gave him... You know, Immortality. In a sense. I mean, here we are talking about him in 2019. His family owned a property called Woodruff Hill. It was on the west side of the Colebrook River in Connecticut. He lived in a cabin or what they called a a shanty in some newspapers. Mm -hmm. But at some point, his family must have had a a home there, a real home, Mm -hmm. because it was his family's property. They weren't poor. 
<laughs> no, that was the thing that kind of shocked me when we started looking at the, I mean, they're from enough of an established Connecticut family to come up in Connecticut family histories. Right, right. And, they, and it was said, you know, multiple articles talk about how good the land was, how they mm. had apple orchards there, you know, it was good, like logging woods, you know, that, that logging companies mm. wanted. And he never sold it for whatever reason. He, you know, I guess he didn't need the money or he wanted to hang on to the family estate. But so something happens to the original family home. And this I cannot find. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it just falls down around his ears, you know, if, if there's some sort of natural disaster or if there's a fire. And part of me thinks maybe there was a fire to the original family home. And if only for the poetry that that will bring to, mm -hmm. to, to the story. But there's no trace of that original family home by the late 1800s, for sure. He's mm -hmm. living in this, what they're calling, like I said, either a shanty or a cabin. Yeah, his, um, what year was he born? 1829? He was born May 11th, 1829. Yeah, his mother dies in 1880. Now, that's a curious thing, too, in that he and his mother and his grandfather all have the same last name. Right. So there doesn't appear to be... A father in the picture or there is not uh, yeah he is a fatherless child born in 1829 there's a woman who's a sort of a town historian named amy baxter and in the 1950s she just kind of writes down her memories and mm -hmm. she talks a little bit about oh she had met them or she knew them she had met uh william she had been to his shanty one time i believe that's what she called it did he have dinner parties? Um, so she was writing in 1952 from a retirement home in Florida at this time. But she's oh, writing okay. down her memories, you know, so she's uh -huh. she's pretty old in 1952. Okay. And she's, she's writing. I guess she visited one his cabin one time in her youth. And she said it was a narrow one-room shack. Now, some of the other reports say it was a three-room shack. So did he add on rooms or maybe she's just, mm -hmm. I don't know if her memory is absolutely perfect or if she knew, I think maybe she was filling in some details of her mm -hmm. own as well. Or if there were several incarnations of like, if you have sort of a semi-permanent structure, you might need to rebuild it on a regular basis. It might not be the same shack that Right, sustains. but there's, there's some other things that she relates that are oh, okay. kind of like may, some jive and some don't okay. with, with William's story. But anyway, she said it was a one-room shack with a bunk, a stove, a chair, piles of old newspapers, and dirt everywhere. <laughs> now, the piles of old newspapers make sense because he had a friend that kind of looked out for him. And she specifically mentioned that they would bring him. She would kind of gather up all the old magazines and newspapers when her friends were done with them. They said he loved to read. So she oh, just would, to give him something to read. She would bring him all these old stuff, things. So that kind of jives with what other people said. When you can get these kind of two people saying two similar yeah. things, it kind of makes sense. So I don't think he was using the newspapers for blankets or anything like that. I think he was yeah. reading them. I think, you know, from all accounts, he liked to read. Baxter kind of suggests in passing that there would have been a larger home at some point, mm -hmm. but does not say. Because he lived with his mother and his uncle and his father grandparents for a while right even into his early adulthood so his mother never said the name of his father for whatever reason it said she never told him never told anyone they said the name of his father yeah that i think that could open up a can of worms and yeah i mean it depends how dark you want to go you got a dark turn of mind <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll say this: is she was in her early twenties, I believe, when he was born. So it wasn't like she was fourteen, right? And imagine how hard a, a fatherless child in eighteen twenty nine is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, how hard it is to be a child without a father. But it seems like I mean, the family kind of looked out for him. They embraced him. I mean, he he was his uncle left him his property and his will and stuff. So it's not like he was disowned or treated mm -hmm. like a, a bastard, but. Baxter said that he was hurried out of sight if people came to visit and so forth. Oh. But how she knows that, I don't know. Because yeah, because she's not old enough to know it, that Exactly. Firsthand. She wouldn't have known him when he was, when he was a little kid. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what she's basing this on. She wrote, which is called Recollections of Colebrook River, and it's basically her journal. It's not published. It's available at the Historical Society 
uh, the Colebrook Historical Society. So it's one person writing her memories in the 1950s. Who knows? How much embellishment, how exactly. much reality, how much memory. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But it's all we have to go on, so. <laughs> it's for his early years, certainly. Mm-hmm. So he went to the River School, which is a, was a community schoolhouse. He did not attend long. According to Baxter, the children were very cruel to him. And after a while, he just stopped going to school. Mm-hmm. He did learn to read. So he, you know, he, he just went seemed that to long. have rather intellectual hobbies, though. Mm-hmm. He did hold down some pretty good jobs until he, he stopped working. So he probably worked on the family farm. Did, I and believe it was, he worked at one point like in a coffee mill? Yeah, yeah, that comes later. It's my guess that he probably quit school to work on the family farm. Yeah, that makes the most sense. More than because yeah. kids were teasing him, but I don't yeah. know. I mean, I wasn't there. So they had apple orchards, and we know that in 1858, that's Nathan Woodruff, his uncle, he leaves all of his land, which was 48 acres at that time, to Charlotte, which is William's mother, and William. So in 1858, all of that is left in his will. Now here's the part that you like. When he was a young man, they said he was a bit of a Beau Brummel. <laughs> a dandy. Yes. I do like a dandy. I know. <laughs> It said that he he had lots of friends in the local young people. He dressed very fashionably, like you said, a, a dandy. That's that's what a, a basically a Beau Brummel is. Yeah, like a someone a, a snappy dresser for the time. He someone been. who's up on fashion mm-hmm. or whatever. He was f- friendly with this kind of clique of young people who supposedly made regular appearances at the local husking bees and barn dances which would have been the social outings at the time mm-hmm. you know we don't know at what point he turned away from society mm-hmm. and or what the precipitating factor is though we do have an inkling we have an inkling we have a romanticized tale mm-hmm. at least it might have no basis in fact some of the newspaper articles some of the stories say that he became a recluse as a young adult other sources say he became a hermit at the age of 46. That's a huge discrepancy. The reason, however, according to all of these, for his mm-hmm. his hermitage is the same in all the stories. And that is he was spurned by a young woman, someone um. he loved. In the 1860 census, you found William, 30 years old at the time, working as mechanic in the 1870 census, he was working in a coffee mill, age 41. So the hermit at age 46 seems to be a lot more accurate. And it almost, yeah, it's pretty closely coincides with the death of his mother as well. So they said that Williams, the focus of his affection, mm-hmm. the girl he, he loved, was one Agatha Hinsdale. I have looked for this girl... I don't know that she ever existed or had that name or had, if that was entirely her name or... Now, if we take the newspaper articles at their word, mm-hmm. at age 20, she would have been less than half his age if mm-hmm. he was 46 at the time. Yeah. She rejected William, calling him an old man. And it seems he headed back to Woodruff Hill and peaced out. I'm done. <laughs> you know, I think I feel like there's the potential for that moment in almost everyone that I'm going to the hills moment. <laughs> <laughs> or so the story goes. So if he did head back home mm-hmm. at that point, he was not in solitude yet because his mother dies January 1880. So he would have been living, you know, with her still mm-hmm. for a few years yet. So in eight, yeah, if that's see, 1870 that's census, he's working in oh, a coffee yeah, so mill. He's 41, little... 46 would have been 1875, and then his mother dies five years later. So it could have been a, these multiple factors mm-hmm. that, for whatever reason, he decided to become a hermit. And it said that his friends would come around and try to coax him out, and, you know, mm-hmm. and... The quote from them was that he had loved and lost and was never the same. 
He refused any invitations, and they said eventually he stopped even recognizing his uh, former friends. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if it's not the other way around. If they stopped recognizing him, yeah. Uh, they noted that the the formerly well-kept William started uh, wearing just one suit of clothes all the time. Uh, his beard and hair were... He would trim them himself, basically, when they got on his nerves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when it became bothersome, he just cut it. But in the pocket of this suit, they said he carried one thing with them all the time. A daguerreotype photograph of Agatha Hinsdale. So she's a mystery. Okay, can we talk a little bit about... So if he was born in 1929... Or 1829. Mm -hmm. She's 20 years younger. Mm -hmm. That puts her... that We're now up to 1849. She's 26 years younger, so... Okay, so that's 18... In the 1850s. In the 1850s. I told me to do the math on the spot. Okay, so she's born in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. So presumably by the time that she's 20 years old, Mm -hmm. maybe this photo would be taken of her? Yeah. Which puts it into the 1870s. I mean, maybe she, maybe it was a photo of a her, younger her. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I know you're trying to do photo <laughs> math. Here. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. That's too late for We're already into albumin photos, but. <laughs> the newspaper said that she was the beautiful daughter of an old-time lieutenant governor. Now there are no lieutenant governors, as far as I know, of Connecticut. Yeah, but we named, did find one in Colorado with that name. Named Hinsdale. Right. There was one in Colorado. We could not find that he had a daughter named Agatha or what she would have been doing in Connecticut. This isn't even like Hartford. You know, this yeah. is kind of a little country town in yeah, Connecticut. Yeah, so why too. would there? Why would he have access to someone of that? You know, it uh, reminds maybe, me. Now, of... maybe they were using her married name later on. Mm-hmm. Maybe she did get married, and they just assumed that everybody knew who Agatha Hinsdale was before, mm-hmm. you know, who her father was. Or maybe mistyped. Yeah, that happens so often. Yeah, uh, misstated or just wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, it could be wrong or, like I said, it could just be a romantic story that someone made up. But it's an odd detail, the mm-hmm. daughter of a old-time lieutenant governor. But we do have this name for this uh, focus of William's affections and she who broke his heart. And we do know what her favorite flower was, supposedly. Hollyhocks, right? Yeah. Are they biannuals? They can be. Okay. They can be. It depends on the kind of hollyhock. I have a get. vague recollection of us having hollyhocks at one time and they were biannual. They were. We did in Glen Rock and mm-hmm. they were biannual. Not all of them are. They're beautiful flowers. Mm-hmm. The colors are um, almost uh, unreal. They're almost like borderline fluorescent, I think, some of those hollyhocks. And it makes me wonder, and I think you said this originally, that he's living in this cabin. So we have a, a very good friend who lived in a cabin by himself mm-hmm. for a long time. And he invented his own calendar. It was based on the moon, and you kind of had to learn his calendar to make plans with him. <laughs> Well, we were talking about William, and we thought, like, what if he just measured time by hollyhocks, by the blooming of the flowers? Mm -hmm. Because these hollyhocks seem to become a very important feature of his life. So we don't know how many years he lived alone there, but he supposedly took a vial of silence eventually. And he would not talk to anyone, it said. (laughs) Now, he breaks this several times. Yeah. There are several times he breaks his vial of silence. But it is a, it's an interesting note, and it's an interesting thing to think of him just in silence growing these hollyhocks. And they said he, he had hollyhocks growing all around, all around his cabin, all these, oh, wow. all these hollyhocks. Uh, spent a great deal of time cultivating these flowers. Like, that's kind of what he worked on, other than growing food. They said he did grow food. You know, this reminds me of Henry Darger in his room with, like, his little obsessive pictures of the one little girl that um, was lost from the newspaper and how he spent, like, an insane amount of time trying to find a newspaper clipping he had lost about her. Mm. And it just this, like, people with that sort of obsessive inner world. Yeah, and it's, I mean, what a contrasting image when you see Willie in his one suit of clothes and he's just 
unkempt and unwashed. And they've made and a then spectacle just, of them. And just but tending these beautiful flowers, mm-hmm. which, you know, they they can grow really high. And so I just imagine him, just this contrast of him sort of tending these flowers like around. Like beautiful, sweet, well-kept flowers. Around and this then... just run-down shack and him him just, you know, in this one suit of clothes working on them, moving like a like some kind of ghost, you know, through these uh-huh. flowers. And it was said, yeah, each summer when they bloomed, he lived by a road. It was the, they called it the Colebrook Road, I believe. And it went right by his cabin. And he would just hand out hollyhocks to anybody who passed. Aww. I don't think it was super frequented, his road. But, you, you know, any, they said anybody who passed, he would give these flowers to. Oh, well, then did he not say anything? Just hand him some flowers? Apparently, if he so was. Do, what, do you think that the general impression from the people in the area was that they were afraid of him or that they. I think he was a curiosity mm-hmm. most of the time. You know, there are some there's some points where he starts acting a little wacky. And, and, and he they, does make the paper even for sort of casual activities like he he's a, a star watcher, right? He has a, yes. a telescope and he becomes a star watcher. Yes. Yeah, at some point, he acquires a telescope. How? How, yeah. How or why? I mean, I guess he had the means. It appears that he had the means. Yeah, yeah, but he... So, again, he's not... He's not a simpleton. No. He's up there, and he's, like, nightly, as far as we know, looking at the stars. Like, he he takes a great interest in looking at the stars and, and observing the sky. And it plays into this whole idea of time for me. Like the blooming hollyhocks, maybe annually or maybe even biannually in the movement of the stars. And he's just alone up there in his cabin. Almost frozen in time. He's wearing the same suit that he wore. With the daguerreotype in his pocket. Yeah, he's frozen somewhere in the mid-1800s. And I think at this point, everyone forgets William Woodruff the farmer, William Woodruff the mechanic, William Woodruff the coffee mill employee. And he just becomes Willie Woodruff the Hermit. Billy. Because we only know those things because of the, you found them in the census. Mm-hmm. None of these articles mention that he ever did anything else. Yeah. Even Amy Baxter's writings in the 50s just basically talk about him as a little kid and then as a hermit later on. And, you know, basically painted him as this sort of like sad figure that was shoved into the side room when people came to visit and then mm-hmm. just became a hermit after that. But that's not the case. Mm-hmm. You know, he had this this other life and it gets forgotten and then he, he becomes the hermit on the hill, on Woodruff Hill. I imagine his days were much the same, you know, every day. He probably had weeks, if not months, with no contact from other people. It Like I said, it was a, it was a rural road that past his place. I mean, people did use it, but it wasn't Yeah, super we're still busy. talking mid-1800s yeah. in America. It was not an overly... Um... And there's a local woman, and she was said to be of some means. Mm-hmm. And she took an interest in William. Her name was Rosella de Wolf. Cool and, name. Yeah. And she would take him groceries every now and then, bake goods, soap... But it it said uh, he often returned the soap unused. (laughs) (laughs) So he could take this back. (laughs) Not going to use it. But he did. He raised chickens. They had the apple orchard. So he had apples, corn, and potatoes. They said. So he raised a lot of his own food. I'm sure he appreciated the help with the groceries. Mm -hmm. But he probably didn't need it. It seems like, you know, maybe in the winter months he needed it more than other times. But he, you know, he raised a lot of his own food. He continued doing farming and stuff. So I think his life kind of continues this way. And we don't get any more news of William for a long time. Until he's in his 60s. And that's 1894. On September 6, 1894, two men break into his cabin. They've heard a rumor that he's got gold or something like this. They beat him up. They knock him unconscious with a sandbag. And it turns sandbagging people. They actually used to do that. Wow. And they Doesn't s- this sort of echo a lot of Nelson Raymire's story? It, yeah, it really does. Um, you know, I was talking to one of his relatives who was a customer of mine, and, and her thought was that 
it had very little to do with the hex and entirely to do with the fact that he lived alone and he was thought to have had some money. Yeah. Well, we talked about that too. I mean, mm-hmm. that was during the depression, mm-hmm. you know, and they said that when they said, where is it to Nelson Raymar, he didn't think hex book for a minute. He thought they were talking about his wallet. He pulled his wallet out, but this <laughs> isn't about Nelson Raymar, <laughs> though. I do know the story. <laughs> So uh, they stole a silver watch from him, an old revolver, and then some small amount of money. That's all they got. Oh, and you got to think they probably only had those possessions. Right. That was probably all he had. Now, Amy Baxter in her writing, she blames this robbery on the photographer from Winstead, Connecticut, who took the pictures of, of William. There's two postcards available. Oh. The one you got me and, and another image. I'll, I'll print them both in the show notes. She blames this attack on that because she said, you know, it made him popular. These postcards. This guy was selling these postcards. Would they have even 1894? They were not. They did not get published until. Yeah, I was going to say that's not postcard Much era. later. Yeah. No. So she's wrong. Yeah. She's wrong about that. Uh, these photo postcards were not produced until the early 1900s. They found about him some other way, or they stumbled upon his cabin. Now, you did see there was another kind of famous hermit in the in New England whom they did make cabinet cards of. So maybe there were a few cabinet cards of him. There were multiple. New England was hermit land, apparently. Which was ridiculous. There were, Why would you spend I, the winter in New right? England? <laughs> Go to Florida. But uh, there were lots of hermits in New England. I have lots of postcards of, of, of these guys. So some of them were really neat. There's really, really neat. So we might do more stories on some of these guys later on because some of them have really, really interesting lives. Mm. Really, really interesting. The thing that really ties William Woodruff mm-hmm. to strange familiars yes. is the Winstead Wild Man. Strange Familiars is brought to you by our patrons. Without our patrons, we could not make Strange Familiars. Thank you very much. If you would like to help us make Strange Familiars, please consider becoming a patron. $3 a month gets you extra shows. We did two full shows this month. We try to do two every month. We guarantee one full episode of Strange Familiars every month. In February, we did three. So we're pumping out content and extra content for the patrons. If you want to help more, there's different levels of support at Patreon. T-shirts, books, stickers, all kinds of stuff Prince, there. Prints, a lot of artwork. You name it. There's all kinds of ways that you can help support us. You go to patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. If you do not like the idea of a subscription and you just want to help us with a one-time payment, in the show notes, there's a paypal.me link. You can go to strangefamiliars.com and check that out there. And the free way to help is to leave us nice five-star reviews at (laughs) iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd be very grateful and appreciate it very much. Have we talked about the Winstead Wildman before? I don't know if I've ever talked about the Winstead Wildman before. In the 1890s, there's a Wildman scare in Winstead. Now, is that a flap? It's a flap. It, this is <laughs> definitely a flap. Is a flap for any kind of multiple sighting, regardless of the phenomenon? I'm not sure. Let's say it is, yes. Okay. Is it like a murder of crows? Like a flap of flannel men? Yes, it is. Uh, These reports are, for the most part, they're talking about big, hairy things. Uh Um, From three hairy men chasing a group of boys in the woods to a ferocious, great, hideous, hairy man beast. Multiple, multiple reports in multiple papers in Connecticut at the time. And because we're strange familiars, Mm -hmm. I'm going to read some of these wild man reports. Because this is about seven miles away from... Oh, I was just going to ask, is it pretty close? Yeah. Yeah, it's about seven miles 
from his cabin to Winstead. So this is uh, 1895 from August 6th. It's from the Hartford Current. The latest story about the wild man is that of an East Winstead resident. He claims that while walking along the Colebrook Road, which is the road that w- William lived on, about 7.30 this morning, he saw the wild man sitting on the piazza of an old deserted house devouring what appeared to be a young pig, which he cut up with an old table knife. Hmm. Just reading some selections. There are actually a lot more than, uh, than what I have here. So this is from the Hartford Current. Again, this is August 24th, 1895. There is no lull in the excitement caused by Selectman Smith's wild man story. It is the topic in every corner of the town. Crowds collect on the street corners and talk it over. Storekeepers neglect their customers to discourse the subject. Shop hands begin to debate the story as soon as the boss turns his back. And in fact, little else is talked about anywhere. The people of the town hardly know what to think of the story. The majority find it hard to believe that there is a wild man in this locality. No one doubts that Mr. Smith saw what he thought was a wild man, but many think a case of mistaken identity. Nevertheless, the select man insists that he is not mistaken, and certain it is, that he was a badly scarred man when he returned home Saturday afternoon. As is usual in such cases, there are many stories floating about of a wild man's being seen around here during the past few years by different parties. One is that he had been seen on the Canaan Mountains several times during the last two years, and he was seen there for the last time about two months ago by hunters. Another story is that some boys from here who were berry picking (laughs) one day last summer in the same lot where Mr. Smith made his discovery ran into town greatly excited and said they had been chased by three hairy men. Another report is that John Robert Cleveland, who lives in Colebrook, and sometimes goes through the lot in question, ran back to the Beardsley farmhouse one day last summer with a face of horror and shaking limbs, and said that he had seen a man covered with hair dodging behind the trees. Mr. Cleveland's story was not believed, and one of the occupants of the house accompanied him through the lot and returned without seeing anything. Mr. Dodd, the stage driver, declares the report false, that he or any of his passengers saw the wild man Thursday. There is great excitement at the farmhouses along the Colebrook Road, and the residents there have their hands on their shotguns the minute the least suspicious noise is heard. John Robert McDowell, Cleveland, was in town today, and in his belt carried an enormous horse pistol fully charged. The 500 men called for to be on hand at 8 o'clock Sunday morning will probably not be around, as it is thought that if a search were to be instituted, it should have begun last Sunday instead of this. A small party will probably start out, however. This is from the San Francisco Examiner. So this this was making the news all around the country. Uh, this is from September 22nd, 1895. Seemed bulletproof. A special dispatch to the Boston Journal from Winstead, Connecticut, under date of August 29th, says that on the afternoon of the day before, Hall's stage left Colebrook for Winstead, and passengers and driver encountered the wild man at close range. Most of them were badly frightened at the apparition, and the broadside of rifle and pistol and revolver bullets discharged at him went wide of the hairy target, which only defiantly reared and snapped his long white teeth at him. The stage met with no adventures on the way from North Colebrook to Colebrook. When it started for Winstead, the superannuated men and the invalids who are guarding the village while the able-bodied citizens are beating up the woods gathered about to see it off. Gannery shook up the reins and barked out a get up, and the two horses trotted away, followed by the apprehensive gaze of those left behind, whose only amusement is the daily betting of whether the stage gets through the suspected territory or not. Are they worried about a stagecoach? Yeah, they're worried about the the wild man getting the stagecoach. Gridley Allen always bets that it will not, doubling the amount of his wager each time. If ever the coach is destroyed by the wild man... He will win the quarter he originally staked. (laughs) Just now, he stands to lose $64. (laughs) The stage bumped quickly along the road between level fields for a mile or so and then plunged boldly into Pamunkey Pond Wood. The tense look upon the passengers' faces heightened and they all gripped their firearms as though afraid that they might take to themselves wings and fly away. Nothing appeared over the slope of Burr Mountain and across the log bridge which spans Pickerel Brook. They went safely but the security was only apparent 
At a point about six miles from Colebrook, there is a rough clearing with a cabin in the middle, which has long been abandoned. As the stage approached the hut, Mark Lederquist exclaimed, See there, in the yard! And as the last words left his lips, the sharp crack of a Winchester was heard. At the same moment, a grotesquely hideous form sprang over the fence and crouched in the road. Everyone recognized it as the wild man. The horses tried to wheel around and run away. Great and hairy, the maniac looked. His mouth was wide open and lined with bristling teeth. His eyes were bloodshot. A matted growth of hair was on his head, and the beard was fully three feet long and blown around by the wind. A rag of cloth about the waist and great claw-like hands were full of what seemed to be rhubarb leaves, which the wild man had probably found and was eating in the deserted garden. Letterquist fired, and the driver sent a shot from his revolver. If either hit, there was no sign. The Philadelphia drummer sat like a carved image, petrified with fear, but plucky little Mrs. Hitchcock grabbed the duck gun, braced the butt against the back of the seat, and pulled both triggers. The first charge tore up the highway in a cloud of dust. The second reduced the ears of the nigh horse to ribbons. Crack, bang, crack went rifle and pistol, while the horses jumped so that they nearly upset the stage. Then the wild man, with a growling roar, made a bound which took him to the side of the road. Another carried him over the fence, and in a succession of strange, uncouth leaps, he crossed the clearing and was presently lost to sight in the woods. So this is, that's like Bigfoot 101 stuff. Growling roars and red eyes and bulletproof. Not bullets not showing effect, rather. They actually call it bulletproof in the in the article, which I find interesting because Josh and I have a chapter on bulletproof Bigfoot in our weird book coming up, weird Bigfoot book. So uh, there's another article which I find particularly interesting in regards to the wild man. And this is from... The Hartford Current, again, this is the 8th of November, 1898. Colebrook Wild Man again. When stage driver John Hall and Fred French were 50 rods above North Colebrook Post Office Saturday, coming towards Winstead, says the Winstead Herald, they saw what they termed a wild man. At least he gave them a great fright, causing their hair to stand on end. The form peered out from the woods at them with wild eyes. His hair was long and scraggly. He wore a long fur overcoat and blue overalls had several white rags tied around his neck, and his feet were covered with an old pair of arctics, and altogether he presented a most wild and uncouth appearance. Messrs. Hall and French watched him for some few minutes, and after they had passed by, he seemed trying to hide something in his bosom. It is believed in Winstead that the person may be one Woodruff, who resides on what is known as Woodruff Hill, Colebrook. Hmm. So as if to bring things full circle in my world. William Woodruff is actually mistaken for a wild man or a Bigfoot at the time, which I just, there's so much poetry in that. How many Bigfoot sightings do you think really are just people? A lot. And a lot of these wild man sightings are probably people, Mm -hmm. you know, but um, that stagecoach when there's a lot of details there that just mirror other Bigfoot sightings. So that that makes me think, um, you know, maybe. How much do rhubarb leaves look like hollyhocks? (laughs) <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so I think uh, that th- this wild man in question was conclusively human and I think it was most likely Billy I think it was yeah. I think it was William Woodruff I wonder if it's the same thing as like in every little neighborhood or town or little village kids make up their own idea their own fairy tale about what certain people are yeah maybe maybe and I, I like to think they said he was clutching something in his breast. I like to think it was the photograph of Agatha that he was yeah. clutching. That's not the last we hear of William, though. His story goes on. Yeah, so now he's like, he's an elderly man. Especially, yeah. like, he's old by, by Victorian standards. Yeah, yeah. In 1901, there's a play that's supposed to be on Broadway. It's It, was, it debuted at the Star Theater on Broadway. It's called The Convict's Daughter. One of the characters in the play is named William Woodruff, a tramp who bears the nickname Weary Willie in this play. Oh, really? Yeah. It wasn't a huge success. It made its way to some other stages across the country. What are the chances that there's this, this happens to be this tramp in this play named William Woodruff? Yeah. I'm thinking somebody bought, saw a newspaper article yeah. and borrowed the just name. Just used the name. But it's, it's a cool little thing. In 1901, William breaks his vow of silence for the first time that we know of, for sure. Was it for a good reason? 
Yes, it was. <laughs> Apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> um, we assume that you could hold your vow of silence and just hand flowers out to people. So, yeah, that makes so sense. Possibly he kept his vow of silence when he did that. He walks to Winstead. So it's a 14-mile round trip. He walks <laughs> just to get pie. <laughs> There's a note in the newspapers that say he comes into town and he asks for a slice of apple pie. The quote was, the kind that mother made. Oh. Uh-huh. Gets his pie and le- leaves again and goes back and to And there's a description of what he looks like, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's... They're saying he's wearing a suit from like 40 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. He's he's dressed in the fashion of some time ago. So the, it holds true that, that he wears his one suit. So I don't know if he effectively breaks his vow of silence with Mm -hmm. this and decides, well, I'll talk to people now. Mm -hmm. Or if, you know, some vows of silence are, I guess it's like being a vegan. Some people are more hardcore than others. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Some some people are vegan except for pizza. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe that he was like that with his vow of of silence. I don't know. But uh, from this point on, he seems to do a lot of talking. Yeah, he seems to make up for lost time. In the spring of 1906... For some reason, he puts a sign out in front of his house, and he starts telling people the road will be closed after April 1st. But it wasn't going to be closed. <laughs> it wasn't. He tells anybody that passes by, he says, I want it understood that the road beside this cabin is not to be traversed. So people, you know, see this sign, and they kind of they report him to the authorities. And at this time, they note that he's, they think... He's unbalanced, and he will be looked after, Mm. locked up if he threatens anyone. Sent to an almshouse or something. But by that summer, by the summer of 1906, the hollyhocks blooming, he's given out for hollyhocks again. Hmm. So anybody who's passing us has come. Maybe it was an April 1st joke, April Fool's joke. Yeah. It says it will be closed on April 1st. Maybe he was doing a goofy April Fool's joke. Who knows? But uh, he resumes his rituals of giving flowers to to anybody who passes. And by this point, he's in his late 70s, right? Don't make me do the math. I think he is. 1907, he makes the news again. So March 21st, I don't know if that was spring equinox 1907 or not, but it's right around the spring equinox. He's outside of his cabin. He's studying the stars through his telescope. And a huge black bear comes up and chases him into his cabin. I wonder if his cabin was even equipped to keep a bear out. He sits down on the other side of the door Uh and he says he can hear the bear basically lay down outside the door and he sits there awake all night and eventually the bear wanders away. But he said he sat there all night with his back against the door with his rifle in hand. And the next day he meets the stagecoach driver and asks him to... uh, bring him some ammunition because he's worried about this bear. The stagecoach driver gets down and actually confirms there were bear tracks around his cabin. So it's not, not anything that uh, he made up. So he agrees to get William some ammunition. And then we get to 1909 or 1910. And that's when the Winstead photographer comes to take his picture. And he takes two portraits that we know of. Do you know anything about whether there was any um, exchange of you know, like a fair rate for using him as a subject or if he got paid or if Billy just I doubt he got was paid okay a with it? Yeah, I doubt, I doubt he got I doubt paid a cent, honestly. So the, f- you know, of the two pictures, one of them, he's uh, kind of staring nobly into the distance. And that's the one I based mm-hmm. my print on the drawing I did of him. It's kind of like a like a sad, just like it just feels like this sort of sad nobility, you mm-hmm. know, that he has. He's in front of what looks to be his cabin. It looks to me like there there might be like hollyhocks down on the ground. It's really hard to tell. It's kind mm-hmm. of they're kind of blurry in the background. I like to think that's what they are, but I yeah, I, I can't say for sure. The other photograph is the mood changes significantly. He's staring at the cabin. He looks. A lot more foreboding in that picture. He looks like he's about to escort the photographer off his property. (laughs) And that actually might have been the case because they said the photographer attempted to interview him and he he, uh, would not give any answers. So he has at this point perhaps resumed his vow of silence. I don't know. Or he just didn't want to talk to the guy. Yeah. So he made and sold 
postcards. I don't know how many with William's image on them. And you can find them at an antique shops and postcard shows today. If you're, if you're looking for them, it's, it made the news, this article, this, the, the fact that this photographer went to take photographs of, of William and said, the quote from that article was, Billy will probably be the last of several famous hermits that made Connecticut their abode. And hmm. it seems to predict William's coming demise because he would not see the hollyhocks bloom again. <sighs> February 19th, 1910, his neighbors notice flames on Woodruff Hill. So the story goes, they come to the scene and they find William sitting silently in the flames, holding a Dick Garretype of Agatha Hinsdale. And there's a beautiful article that describes him as kind of a new world Odin, sacrificing himself for love. Oh, wow. Carried by the flames as if they're Valkyries. Oh, wow. That's amazing. But uh, he didn't go to Valhalla that night. Yeah. He's badly burned. His cabin's destroyed. They were able to get him out of the fire. Upon entering, they did smell kerosene and they thought that he set the fire himself. There's another account. It's less dramatic, no less tragic. And it has William smoking a pipe in bed. Mm -hmm. And sparks from the pipe hit his beard. Caught his beard on fire, which then caught his bed on fire. And according to this article, after extinguishing the fire himself, he walked two miles through the cold February night in stocking feet until he reached the house of a neighbor. Oh, I wonder which one's true. There was no doctor, I guess, in Colebrook River. They had to send for a doctor from New Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. It's a good bit away. Not Boston, it's New Boston. It's mm. over, right over the line from, from Connecticut there. But still, his name was Dr. Ward. He attended William, and he believed William would die from the burns. That's what he said. This was February? This was, yeah, in February of... 1910. So February 19th is when the fire is noticed. So this is either that day or, mm -hmm. or the next, I'm, I'm assuming. And according to Amy Baxter, after the fire, he was taken to the Winstead Hospital to recover and then boarded with, quote, a kindly woman to live out the rest of his years. Which weren't years. Yeah, it, it, that's a pleasant little end to the story, but mm -hmm. that's not how it went. Mm -hmm. and the records tell a much more painful tale. He died May 19th, 1910. If the burns were that bad, that was probably a pretty dreadful couple months there mm -hmm. from February to May. He would have suffered terribly. He was in his 80s at this point. Would not have been a good, pleasant end, although it was noted. And this, this is written down that he never uttered a groan. Hmm. He kept his vow of silence, even through the pain, they said. Huh. I wonder if there's truth to that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's so hard to weave out the, the romantic story of the flower-tending hermit from the truth, you know? I mean, I I tend to go with the more beautiful, romanticized tale just because, I mean, let's honor the guy. Let's give him a good story. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, so he's got a simple gravestone. It stands in the new Colebrook Cemetery, Colebrook, Connecticut. It only has his name on it name at birth and death dates no epitaph comparing him to odin unfortunately that should have been his epitaph <laughs> no notes that he died for love no notes about him searching the skies with his telescope or giving flowers to people who pass by all these wonderful things he did someone needs to to plant hollyhocks and around i was there. saying there's no hollyhocks growing on his grave there needs to be do uh, we have any strange familiars listeners near I don't know. Colbert, Connecticut. I, I know, know it's kind of near, um, it's what, Litchfield County. I was going to try to swing by, if Josh is willing, on our way back from the X-Files convention. I was going to try to <laughs> swing out that way, perhaps. I wonder if he ever read his own story in the newspapers. His friends were giving him newspapers. Oh, yeah. Like if I bet that would be very amusing. Yeah, I wonder if he ever read about himself in those. And, uh, or if you have that kind of existence, I feel like there's probably a real death of self if he would even recognize they were talking about him yeah i don't know i'm sure he would recognize his name yeah you know? this is dozens of articles there are literally dozens of articles were written about william woodruff in his lifetime he had postcards bearing his image 
over a century later, we're doing an episode of Strange Familiars about William Woodruff. He was dirty, lonely, and sad, but his life inspired wonder, you know, and creativity even. Yeah. It just reminds me of that favorite quote of mine, Emerson, about in the woods I return to reason and faith. There I find nothing can befall me that nature can undo. Yeah. And, you know, the rich and beautiful Agatha Hinsdale, we know nothing about her. Yeah. I think that says so much. Mm Mm-hmm. It's William's story, the the lonely, spurned story of, of the hermit with the vow of silence. And we know his story. And she's just become a little player Mm -hmm. in the story of his life. He really seems like he's doing sort of like a monastic life in service of nature. Yeah, it's beautiful. And that's one of the reasons I... So I like the idea of folk saints. Mm -hmm. And people might notice that I title my print St. William of the Fiery Flowers. I love the image of these the flowers burning around him and Mm -hmm. and him holding the daguerreotype, which I, I show in the image. I think we should look to people from history that inspire us and create our own saints. Mm-hmm. In the I don't same think the Catholic w- Church should get all the fun. The We were already making our own archetypes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And the, I mean, the, the early Irish saints, they were just, they, they weren't approved by the church. They were just, you know, folk saints, essentially. Now, a lot of them got adapted mm-hmm. in, got folded in to the Catholic Church, but they weren't... And there are a lot of cultural saints from smaller communities that yeah, Latin, become part Latin of... Yeah, Latin America has a lot of folk saints, mm-hmm. you know. I thought, why not? These are people from, from history that inspire mm-hmm. me. So I made him into St. William of the Fiery Flowers. And not to turn a beautiful story into a sales pitch, but if you do want the print, <laughs> <laughs> I do have them. And patrons, you'll get a special offer on those. Yeah, but. and if you ever need a daguerreotype and you'd like to reenact that yourself... I could help you out with Ooh. that, too. Isn't that nice? Oh, man. Get a daguerreotype, but don't reenact it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the story, as far as we know, of William Woodruff. And it started with a little postcard you got me, which thank you for that. It, oh, it was yeah. was like this wonderful little you know, dive into history. That's the way it starts. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. And there's so many more. There's so many more of these guys with these great stories. Which we'll tell, we'll tell some more later on. There's some really, really fabulous stories about these guys. Some of them are sad, some of them are tragic, and some of them are just, I mean, some of these guys were poets and, and healers and, and just amazing, amazing stories. Yeah, because there is there are two narratives. They're the people that retreat to the woods because something has happened to them that's made them reject society. And then there are people that retreat to the woods because they just want to be in the woods. Yeah. You know, what's the difference between Thoreau and Billy Woodruff? I I mean... PR. Essentially, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that uh, William wrote any poetry, but would love it if he did. Uh Though it would probably burned up. (laughs) So, St. William of the Fiery Flowers. That's our tale of him. Got some Bigfoot stories in there, too. Got some wild man stories. So, it's a very... To me, it's a... as strange familiar as things get mm-hmm. you know you get the, the Bigfoot and you get the wild man and the forgotten history all together yeah so. thank you patrons thanks patrons <laughs> you guys make strange familiars happen thanks everybody for listening so we will be back next week with more strange familiars lots of stuff coming up got some crazy flannel man stuff coming up got a whole grab bag of stuff coming up no shortage of content i might be releasing some bonus episodes for everybody coming up but we'll see i have to get to work writing this weird bigfoot book with josh as well if you'd like to help us out art prints too that's another way you get to help we got the saint william of the fiery flowers art print you can also find a t-shirt of that image at our T Public site. We'll be back next week. Strange Familiars is brought to you by Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com. 
Intro and background music is by Stonebreath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. And we are on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash strangefamiliars and like the page there, and you can join the Strange Familiars Gathering Group. This path it is not straight Though very narrow is its way My feet they are not twined To this long and lonely street
follow the hum. <laughs>